welcome to a special edition of Dads and Daughters, uh, season two, episode eight, with my girls Kelly and Jenna, aka Lovey and the Babushka. Uh, thanks to all who tuned into our show last week, our DP MMR fundraiser. We did out of Key Largo with Johnny Damon and family. We had almost 3,000 views. So thanks for all the support. And check out animalnecessity.com for more information on how to contribute and save those dolphins. And want to thanks to our Jerry Cooney uh, fight sponsor and show sponsor, the A-Game Drink. And uh, thanks to those guys. And many of you have seen that we have resumed our Loving the Babushka carpool videos the last couple of weeks. Uh, now that school's back, uh, where we have a hybrid model of one week on, two weeks remote. So school safety is at the top of my mind again, as is what most parents with what we witnessed with the uptick of school shootings that have happened, uh, obviously because of failures of our leaders to curb the sale of assault rifles and implement gun safety legislation across the board. Um, the only guns I've ever, own, ever owned myself is my 20 inch uh, guns, my biceps. But as many of our viewers know, I was a World Trade Center injured survivor, but I was also at the Mandalay Bay uh, during the Route 91 shooting on October 1st, uh, 2017. So I was part of two horrific tragedies, but you know, the shots being fired above me on October 1st, that was the first time I was ever around guns and assault rifles. And that Vegas shooter, um, he modified a dozen of his 23 firearms that night to shoot like uh, automatic weapons using an alteration known as bump fire stock and a very scary night traumatic uh triggered a lot of ptsd for me but our guest tonight fred gutenberg has also been involved in two horrific tragedies only four months prior to the parkland shooting his brother michael passed away in october of 2017 from cancer related to his service on 9 11 as a responder and he then lost his beautiful 14-year-old daughter, Jamie, in the Parkland shooting on February 14, 2018. And Fred has led a fight, as most people know, with our political leaders to mandate gun safety legislation and to prevent continuing acts of gun violence. And his priorities include raising the minimum age to buy guns, adding a waiting period before gun sales, and having a no loopholes policy for a mandatory background check of the gun buyer and banning high capacity ammunition magazines and bump stocks, like I said earlier. Uh, Fred exemplifies the principles I always adhere to around perseverance and resilience in memory of his daughter, Jamie. And, you know, Kelly uh, has made a very prolific statement um, that was about, let me, uh, about on February 14th on the anniversary. And yes. Kelly, I'd like you to read this statement, which you made on your page on Facebook. Kelly is a prolific writer, as many of you know, and this issue is very dear to Kelly. So Kelly, why don't you read that statement first? Three years ago today, in loving memory of the 17 victims of senseless and tragic gun violence from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in the community of Parkland, Florida, we still say change is needed. We will not forget we will continue to stand for an issue that is a matter of human life and safety. No one should have even had the ability to take these lives. Each one of them with families, friends, hobbies, and a bright future. Each one of them deserved to see and do more. Lastly, each one of them deserved to be safe and make it home from school that day. I stand 100% with the brave students and families who spoke out and rallied for reform after that horrific day and will continue to. Don't ever let anyone minimize your voice to your age. You are reaching more people than you know. Keep fighting for safety, kindness, peace, laws, and change. A great organization to look up related to this tragedy is Orange Ribbons for Jamie in memory of victim Jamie Guttenberg, who was a freshman as I was at that time. To this family, thank you for using your voice so we can all be safer in our communities. Well, we want to play a video of uh, Fred's speech, which I think was heard around the world um, on February 15th, the day after the shooting. So let's just play that video real quick. Impossible. My girl, my 14-year-old baby, and for those of you who know my Jamie, she was the life of the party. She was the energy in the room. She made people laugh. And yes, sometimes she made us cry, but she was always known. She always made her presence felt. I sent her to school yesterday. She was supposed to be safe. I, my job, is to protect my children. And I sent my kid to school. In the morning, sometimes 
Things get so crazy. She runs out behind, and she's like, I got to go, Dad, bye. And I don't always get to say, I love you. I don't remember if I said that to Jamie yesterday morning. <laughs> Parents, love your kids, hold your kids, kiss your kids, and don't ever, ever miss the chance to tell them how much you love them. Well, I think since Fred's uh, that speech, I can tell you I haven't missed a morning where these girls, they get it over and over and over again. You see it on the carpool videos I share on my page, and uh, obviously that uh, very gripping. I want to welcome in Fred right now to the show, and uh, and Fred, I know, is backstage. And Fred, uh, we had met back in April of 2019 uh, when we brought a group of 9-11, uh, World Trade Center, Las Vegas, Columbine, Aurora, and Boston Marathon family members and survivors to Parkland for a peer support roundtable, right, Fred? And that coincides with what you said and in your book I have right in front of me called Find the Helpers. Um, very important message there. And, you know, Fred Rogers once said, always look for the helpers. There will always be helpers because if you look for the helpers, you'll know there's hope. So I just actually want to take a minute to have that Fred Rogers, a real quick clip of that, and then we're going to get on to some questions for Fred. Always look for the people who are helping, she'd tell us. You'll always find somebody who's trying to help. So even today, when I read the newspaper and see the news on television, I look for the people who are trying to help. You know, my mother used to say, a long time ago, whenever there would be any really cat catastrophe that was on the, in the movies or or on the air, she would say, always look for the helpers. There, were, there will always be helpers, you know, even just on the side. Welcome, Fred. So you, you've been through so much um, in the last three years, obviously. Talk about what that message has meant to you over the last three years and what the theme, because that book is so powerful. Kelly, you've read it twice. Yes. I read it three times. Uh, we've all read it and just an amazing book. So I just want to open up to you just about that message. We don't go through anything alone. You know, whether it's the most amazing moments in life or the hardest moments in life, we don't go through them alone. And, you know, the concept of, of, of helpers didn't become clear to me until I was writing the book. And, and candidly, Mike and Kelly, where it really hit me was when I was writing something about 9-11. And on the day of 9-11, I was talking about the lady who went to where the triage was set up that my brother was, was working at the time. If you recall, my brother was at the World Trade Center before the second building got hit. In the World Trade Center when it collapsed, because nobody thought it was going to collapse, that's where they were going to set up the triage. Eventually, they sent it. they set it up blocks away. But he never had a chance to call his family and say, hey, I'm okay. So by the afternoon, we assumed we lost him. And that afternoon, some lady went by where the triage was and just said, I'm sure you all have a loved one. Just give me a name and a phone number. She called my parents and said, I've spoken to your loved one. He's okay. He'll call you when he can. She was a helper. I never thought of it that way until I was writing this book. But I started looking at every significant moment in my life, and it involves people like her. As much as I'd love to think I did this, I did that, I'm responsible, I'm responsible for that, the truth is every significant moment was possible because of the amazing um, connections to other people. Yeah. And so my advice to people is always know who your people are. Always know who your helpers are, but also, more important maybe, always make sure you're being a helper whenever you can. Well, I can tell you my story, you know, Fred, as you probably know, Oklahoma City, where my yes. house, um, yeah, I was in 9-11 after I got out of the hospital and to the pier, and I met these wonderful people that drove up from Oklahoma City up to New York when there were no flights going up there, and they were there to help us. And we have done this uh, amazing program that Anthony Garter and I have done over the last 19 plus years and having a support program between Oklahoma City 
and New York City with 9-11. And uh, it's they were my helpers. Uh, I didn't have a psychologist, a one on one person that I can go to. But these people were my peer support group and they were my helpers. And I've had many helpers, but they were the first ones that really, uh, really transformed uh, my experience in moving on and becoming resilient. So I just wanted to share that. And, and I think the book has such a powerful. Yeah. We all got to find it. So listen, and you mentioned Anthony Gardner. Now, for people who don't know who that is, you know, he oversees, to a large extent, the memorial of 9-11. And, and years ago, I was put in contact with him because of my desire to do more there to honor those who were present on 9-11, who didn't die that day, who have gone on to have lives, in many cases have gotten sick and are dying later on, but you know they're not on the wall. They're not etched in the wall. There, they're they weren't necessarily as remembered. And I want people like my brother to be remembered. And because of those conversations and people like Anthony Gardner and and, and others, there's now a section at the memorial called the Glade, which honors those who didn't die that day, and and gives the families of them those people a chance to go there still and reflect. Um, you know, this world is full of amazing people. We have to open up our hearts and let them in. Yeah. Well, Kelly, you have a question you wanted to ask as well. I'd uh, let you roll through a couple of uh, questions you had about Jamie. Can you tell us about Jamie and some of the things she enjoyed, like dancing? Jamie was um, my amazing, beautiful little girl. And you just mentioned one of the things that she loved to do, and it was dance. Um, listen, Kelly, I know you do cheerleading, and maybe you're like Jamie in this regard, but it didn't matter how much practice Jamie did with dance. It didn't matter how tired she was. When she came home and she had a chance to chill, she'd start dancing around the house. <laughs> she like loved it so much. You understand. I mean, she loved yeah. it so much. And, you know, you um, may have seen, I, I post all over this quote that Jamie really lived her life by. Dreams and dedication are a powerful combination. Jamie had big dreams, and she dedicated herself to doing the things that she wanted to do. You know, she was an amazing young person who had her life figured out, but she was a fighter for other people. She despised bullies when she saw people getting bullied in school. She would put herself in between the bully and the person being bullied, and she would make it stop. She volunteered her time for kids with different types of um, abilities. She was planning to go to school to become a pediatric physical therapist. Uh, in fact, it was her dream to work with kids with limb deformities and help a child walk for the first time. My daughter lived her life to be, she, it was her life that she wanted to be a helper. That's who she was. And you know what? I'm now her voice. And together, Jamie and I are going to help by eradicating gun violence. And Kelly, you have another question around that too, but um, you want to read that? What made you start Orange Ribbons for Jamie and Orange Ribbons for Gun Safety, and how did you embrace your national role on gun safety and control as a voice of change? So, you know, Orange Ribbons for Jamie kind of started by accident. Um, the day Jamie was killed, her dance sisters came, they went to the studio that day, and they started making orange ribbons because orange actually happens to be Jamie's favorite color. And the next day they came to our home they went up to Jamie's bedroom with their orange ribbons on and they started posting photos of themselves in Jamie's bedroom with some of Jamie's stuff, having a very emotional meeting. And the photos went viral and dance studios across the country started dedicating performances to Jamie by wearing the orange ribbon. And then Broadway, Lion King, Hamilton and some other shows did the same. So I was wearing this orange ribbon for a few weeks after Jamie was killed not thinking anything of it until one day somebody asked me about it and asked me what it meant. And when I told them, they said, do you know that's the color of the gun safety movement? And I didn't know that. And that day I decided to start this foundation, which originally was, I just wanted to make this the symbol. It has since evolved to be a lot of other things. 
Um, and so our endurance for Jamie is, is geared towards supporting things that matter to Jamie in life. Our endurance for gun safety is more of an advocacy group, which is geared towards fighting for gun safety. Um, but all under the orange ribbons umbrella. Yeah, that was similar to what we had in 9-11. We had the coalition of 9-11 families with Anthony Gardner, all the leaders, Mary Fetch, we all kind of yeah. did on advocacy. That's Anthony Gardner right there. Yeah. And we had that, that was more our advocacy to fight for a proper memorial, but we also had our WTC United Family Group, which was our charity that had more peer support, uh, the Oklahoma City program. So we had two separate wings. People sometimes got them confused, but we said Coalition 9 11 Families is what we're using to advocate with the governor, with the mayor, to make sure that the 16 acres was sacred ground. That was the footprints, the bedrock. I mean, all that preservation efforts we did was through coalition, but our charity was our charity. So that totally makes yep. sense. And uh, so, Fred, what is Jamie's law? I know Kelly had that as her next question. What is, uh, talk a little bit about that. Listen, I, I think the most important thing we can do to deal with the issue of gun violence is to address ammunition. Mm -hmm. There's already 400 million weapons on the streets of America today, many in the hands of those who don't um, intend us good things, who intend harm. Um, sometimes they get stolen. Sometimes they get illegally transferred. None of them work without bullets. And the problem is, you may be a prohibited purchaser who can't walk into a store and buy a firearm, which is why you need to steal it or, or, or get it from somebody. But you're able today in America, doesn't matter who you are, to walk into any store and buy the bullets. There's no requirement for a background check on just bullets. Jamie's Law seeks to extend background checks to bullets. If you want to start saving lives immediately, if you control who's buying bullets by just having a background check, you'll be able to save lives immediately. Yeah. And yeah. that's what Jamie's law does. Yeah, Fred, we were sharing something earlier today. I was texting you just about somebody I was, uh, made you aware of that a, was a convicted felon who was, who was able to buy, uh, you know, an assault rifle, an AR-15 through uh, this website that pops up. I don't know the, the legitimacy of it, but... Uh, Pretty, pretty scary that there's a lot more work to do. And it opened my eyes to say, look, we, you made a, you've made a lot of great strides and amazing things you've done in the last three years, but there's a lot more work to oh, do. Oh, listen, yeah. we've only scratched the surface. Um, you know, and, and part of the problem is much of the good work, the successes have happened at state levels, but many other states have actually gone in the other direction. So while a state like your old hometown, you know, New York or in New Jersey, maybe doing really great things, there's states like, uh, you know, uh, Ohio, which is going in the exact opposite direction. Uh, and, and so, you know, we just need to keep working hard. And ultimately, we need to solve the issue of gun violence at a national level because you're only as safe as the closest borders. Um, so we have to solve it at a national level. Yeah, Kelly, you had a question about that too. You want to read that? How can we be more vigilant and make our schools safer? Listen, it, that's a great question. And I, I'll tell you this. I'm going to, I tell the kids across this country um, who have shown us how amazing they are since Parkland and how effective they are using their voices to never stop. You know, we in this country, I think, got sucked into this belief that our voices don't matter. Our votes don't matter. Um, and so for too many years, we didn't really speak up when things were wrong. We stopped voting. And Kelly, the most, you're a senior now. I'm not sure if you're 18 or not yet, but you say not. Okay. So my advice to you, the most important thing you can do forever to make sure you're leaving your mark is vote. Use your voice, go to town halls, challenge elected people. They get elected to serve you. And most of the times we have these town halls that they hold and nobody shows up. We should be showing up. 
And if we like what they're doing, we should tell them. But if we don't like what they're doing, we need to tell them. We should use our social media platform. You and your dad have this show. You should continue using this to highlight issues that are important to you. But most important, don't ever think your vote doesn't matter. Show up and vote. Yes. That's great. Kelly, you want to ask a question about uh, here about obviously Fred's relationship with the um, President Biden. So I'll let you. Can you speak to your personal connection and friendship that you made with President Biden before and during his presidential campaign to share his perspectives in finding your mission and purpose and learning to grieve? Listen, um, I'll just say he's an amazing person who probably about a week after Jamie was killed, reached out. And we had just an amazing conversation, probably about 45 minutes. He was on a train going from Virginia to New York for, at the time, his son, Bo Biden's foundation. And he spoke to me. He wanted to know more about me, about my wife, about my son, but mostly about Jamie. And he wanted to know what my plan was. And when I told him that I really wasn't sure, other than knowing I want to break the gun lobby, he spoke to me about mission and purpose and about what that would be like, but about how he got through grief, because he's someone who's been through a lot of grief, about how he got through it by doing important things, by, by, by mission and purpose. And those words have stayed with me forever. Um, the other thing he did is he invited me to meet with him on a personal level at a, a fundraising event again for the foundation a few weeks later in Florida. And I thought I would have like two minutes to shake his hand because he had several hundred people waiting to talk to him. He pulled myself and one of the other Parkland dads into a private room. And again, he spent about 40, 45 minutes talking to us while this whole group of people was waiting for him. And he spoke to us very deeply about what to expect going forward through grief, but how our families, we all grieve differently and about how we need to be prepared for that. He had such a, a, a desire to just help us be okay because he's an amazing guy with true empathy and compassion. Um, and I'm very thankful that he is our president now. Well, I remember the first time at Cal Ripken's event in Maryland uh, for his obviously supporting his son's foundation. And I ran into him on 9-11 at New York, uh, you know, on the World Trade Center ceremony and ran to a lady there that knows you very well. Tish James, the New York State Attorney General, who said remarkable things about you. And Tish, is, she's tough New York. And uh, she talked about that, too, because, I mean, she loves you. Well, she's a hero to me. <laughs> you know, so. Um, you know, listen, I've often said some of the attorney generals around this country are the most important people in this fight for gun safety because they have taken this issue on and she's one of them. You know, she has tackled the NRA um, and has shown the country that they were fraud. That's what they are. You know, people would think the NRA was struggling because of Americans being fed up with violence, but what they actually did is they started ripping off their members and she caught them and she, she called it out. And I just, I can't say enough about her and her work to make Americans safer by taking on this lobby. And the consequences of that are not just going to be felt in the immediate future. It's going to be felt over time for a long time. Because that organization will never, ever um, have the say that they once did. Yeah. And I'm very, there's, listen, there's Tish James, there's, you know, you go over a state to New Jersey, the work they're doing there, or in Pennsylvania with Josh Shapiro. I mean, yeah, Josh just, Shapiro's going to mention that. Uh, what he did today, working with the largest gun permit yes. in Pennsylvania to stop the sale of ghost guns. I mean, I saw that today. I mean, that's it's work like that that makes you believe that small steps can be. I know we can't solve all the history of all these problems, but when you see things like that, even the Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, they I always hated walking in there seeing all that stuff there. But you know what they did afterwards, I said, you know what, that's actually makes me believe in America that we can make some change. And you know, listen, 
those steps save lives. Yeah. It's that simple. And what there cannot be anything more important that our elected leaders do than work to keep us safe and to save lives. Yeah. And those steps will. Yeah, we'll talk about your bi-monthly podcast, Find the Helpers. I know we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I know you do an amazing podcast yourself, and you've had Alyssa Milano. You've had some great guests on, I think, that are really your helpers that you've had on. Talk a little bit about that to honor your daughter and also the scholarship program that you do to honor Jamie as well, I think is an amazing tribute. Yeah, listen, what, what I'm trying to do is, and especially during this time of COVID where people are going through terrible times, is to really highlight all of the helpers that are out there, whether it's our neighbor or somebody else that we see on the television or somebody that we read about. The truth is there are amazing people across this country who simply want to help make this a better place for you, for us. And we just need to really um, allow ourselves to embrace that because we don't go through anything alone. And, and yeah. so that's what I'm trying to highlight. With regards to the scholarship, it, it is something that um, I, I, I'm just truly proud of and really proud of my wife for the work she's doing with this. It, it is, it is um, what I call the legacy thing that we're doing for Jamie and our agreements for Jamie. And it, it's, it's called for kids of all abilities. It's one of the few scholarships that recognizes that reality that we're, we, we all are entitled to go on to a post high school education. And so our scholarship program rewards kids who are going to school to become a helper. Maybe it's a therapist or a doctor. And the re only requirement is you have to have community service. You know why? Because Jamie did. And I think it's important. The other bucket is for someone who's going to go on to become a dance major, but they also have to, have to have community service. And then the third bucket is for a student with a documented um, need, um, you know, um, and who maybe won't go on to a traditional four-year college education or might. But, you know, these scholarship programs are often based upon a certain set of criteria that aren't always – attainable for everybody. And so we try and make sure our program is available for all kids of all abilities for whatever type of post high school education they're going to go on for. And um, last year, we gave away 14 scholarships. Um, I, we chose 14 because Jamie was 14. Yeah. Um, this year, um, I think we'll probably give away 14 again. Um, but we still haven't made that final decision because we've got a lot of scholarships, yes, yeah. really talented, great people. So, um, I'll say orange ribbons for Jamie.org. That's the website. Orange ribbons for Jamie.org is the website. So uh, I will encourage, and I ran to a comedian, a friend of yours, Fred, Jim Brewer, great yeah. guy, big Met fan, but he did a comedy, uh, benefit for you, I believe a year Last and a half. Year. Yeah. yeah, before COVID and uh, said great things. But to wrap up the show, Kelly has one last question, and then you can take us off with this last question here, Kelly. So do you want to ask that? Because this is the most important question of the whole show. What honestly. do you hope for the future in building a safer world, short-term and long-term? Loaded question. But oh, listen, but it's a great question. Um, I hope that this year, I don't, and I don't want to wait till next year, I hope that this year we get – a common sense, bipartisan gun safety legislation passed in Washington, D.C., that Republicans and Democrats alike are able to embrace and where we can start changing the way we think about guns and our safety. You know, this is not a Second Amendment issue. The argument never was. That was always bogus. This is a public health issue. And if we Americans can start to say, yeah, we want to protect the rights of gun owners, but we also need to protect our rights to be safe, that's my hope. And I want to do it this year. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to set up the show. I want to thank everybody for joining. And I think everybody as parents, as citizens, 
need to do their jobs. So we got to build an army around Fred and what he's doing to make this world a better and safer place. So if there's one message is that we all are in this together. We got to protect our children so this doesn't happen again. Always remember, never forget, we said on a 9-11, but Parkland, 2 14, 18, it'll never be Valentine's Day to me. I know to you, Fred, it will not be. That day itself is always going to be remembering those uh, senseless lives that were lost as a result of gun violence and should never happen again. So thanks uh, for joining. Uh, very most Our most important show I believe we've done. And uh, thank you again for Fred for taking your time and can't wait to see you again real soon. Take care. Good luck with cheerleading and uh, we'll talk to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Talk to you later. Okay.